we're good. Okay, welcome everyone. Um, so I see Jeremy's online. Is Jennifer up there? She is. She is. Um, our board president will not be joining us tonight. Um, Zane is online. This is the board superintendent and Paul are here and other distinguished guests. <laughs> so we'll go ahead and start with uh, Ken Crawford. Turn time over to him about a report on our construction projects. Okay, thank you, Joyce. I will be sharing my screen now. Can you all see that? Yes. Ken, you're on mute. Yeah, there you go. That's weird. I didn't even mute myself <laughs> that I knew of. You gave me the okay. I thought I was good. All right, let's try it again. Blame our tech people. <laughs> it, it, it was it was operator error. There's all these buttons down at the bottom, and I'm trying to hit the right ones, and I must have scooted it over too far. Okay, so this is the an image from the south entrance of the uh, health and PE facility. So you can see quite a bit more work is being done. They've got the windows in. They've got the brackets for perforated panels to go up. Um, they're really starting to move along. The images that you see here on the left, so this is directly west of the health and PE facility. So they've already started pouring some of the concrete. And then where the gentleman is in the light green shirt, uh, that's where the parking lot asphalt will go and that should have started on Tuesday. So I'll, I'll be there on site in the morning, but that should have been poured on Tuesday. As I continue down the next image, this is the Mondo flooring that is going down in uh, inside the third gym, the indoor practice facility. And they should be wrapping that up. Uh, they may actually be done this week with that one. And then just some of the cabinetry is starting to go in. I believe this is for the hosting room that's up on the third floor. It also doubles as a classroom. And then Ken, this is the Yes. Um, Mondo flooring. Is that a brand name or is that a process yeah, it, or something? It is. Okay. Yeah, it's 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 the brand. It's a, it's a rubberized flooring. Okay. Um, we actually have quite a bit of Mondo in this. So the um the weight rooms have Mondo flooring in it. The track is a Mondo flooring. So that, that is the brand. And they, they have a few different types, but it's basically a rubber flooring and they're, they're uh, a special specialist in that flooring. Okay. Thanks. You bet. And then this last image here, this is the main gym and this is the wood flooring that's going in. So you can see they've got about three fourths of it laid in this image. Um, when I was, the last time I was there, they were even further along and um, they probably are really close to having that done uh, today. Going back up just to look at the list on the on the right with the three week look ahead. Um, as I mentioned, they are pouring that concrete and they are working on the driver's ed um, portion there on the southeast corner of the building. We've got plumbers that are starting to install some of the toilets and, and other fixtures. Um, we already talked about the asphalt, the glazing, that's for uh, some of the different windows that are, that are being completed and finished up. Uh, as we scroll down a little bit, we've got um, carpet that is going to be installed in the next couple of weeks. It, it hasn't happened yet, but they they may, are starting either this week or next, I believe. Um, we've got what else? Oh, some of the paneling. 
it'll be going up. The, the panels have been painted. It, it kind of looks similar to the blue that is in this, but that MDF paneling goes on the inside, but it's to correspond with these blue panels that are on the outside. So that's what that, where it says painting MDF panels in the gym, that's what those are. So they, they're getting those painted and they're going to start hanging those. And then we have the elevator that should be installed starting this week. The K13, that's a, an insulation that goes on the ceiling. And we're starting to get partitions. The one door is the, uh, are the fire doors. Those are going in. And then in a couple of weeks, we should have ballistic film going up as well. So that's the latest on the Ben Lomond facility. Do we have any questions about that project right now? No, I'm assuming that pictures you just showed are not the same things we have. Yeah. Because I couldn't find the same thing. No. So I so I try and give you the I have to submit some of this stuff um by the deadline last week, okay. like a week and a half ago, but I've had two updates since then so i what i've tried to show you is the latest update otherwise the what you're you're seeing is is two weeks old um and so that was the latest report that i just got yesterday okay and i, I have to send this to paula and she can send that out as well but i want to make sure that you have the latest update especially since we're getting um so much closer to the project being completed all right thank you <laughs> yes you probably said that, but when is the date that we are expecting it to be completed? So substantial completion right now is scheduled for October 31st. Um, they have until uh, they have until October or sorry, November 7th um, as kind of the drop dead date for the building because we want it all taken care of so that our um, teams will be ready to have their tryouts starting November 9th. Uh, just a quick question, Ken. Yes. I was just wondering if that big windstorm we had a, a couple of weeks ago, did that have an effect on anything you guys were doing? Um, not really. We were, we were prepared. Um, so we didn't have any reported damages. With this project, because most of it is closed in, um, it didn't really do anything. Uh, a lot of the Horace Mann project is mostly closed in, so we didn't have anything there. Uh, Polk is mostly uh, a shell of the old building. It's still standing, um, so we're, we're okay there. And then uh, T.O. Smith, nothing had happened up to that point. Um, but Chris will talk about it in just a minute. We have started demolition though, and that building is knocked down. Or we may let Chad talk about it a little bit as well. Okay, thanks. Any other questions on the Ben Loman facility? I think we're good. Okay, then we've, I believe we've got Chris Karchner online and he will take over presenting on our other bond projects then. Okay. Maybe. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. yes, go ahead, Chris. All right, can everyone see the the presentation screen? No. no. Okay. Unless he's presenting Ken. <laughs> Ken is awful good looking. <laughs> why we would do that. Um, says I am sharing, but for some reason it's not showing. So we've got it now. It, now. Again. it just came up, Chris. You're good. Okay, so you can see it all right then? Nope, not now. It just disappeared. Well, 
I have re I've redone it, so hopefully it will start to change over now. Nobody move. The mic's here. There we go. We're good, Chris. Go ahead. Okay. So, uh, members of the board and uh, guests, thank you very much for the opportunity to present an update on the bond program projects. Let, we'll just jump right into it. Uh, this is the first month. It's kind of interesting. We don't. We're not talking about Wasatch, which uh, fortunately the students are in. They're working. We are completing just a couple small minor uh, punch items on that and some of that work is actually going to be completed over break so we're not disrupting the student environment but the project is done and the students are working on it so talking about horse man uh, horse man elementary is moving rather quickly and to answer the question uh, we did experience quite a bit of wind however it didn't seem to have damaged any of the work that we had ongoing uh, fortunately, we didn't really have glass in place, so the wind just kind of blew through the building, um, which was fortunate. So uh, the steel exterior framing is moving quite rapidly. Uh, inside the building, we have ductwork, plumbing, and electrical going on. On the outside, we are putting up mason cladding um, and uh, working on finishing the roof. And we're actually going to be doing some site work and some asphalt so that we are weathered on the ground and hopefully can avoid some of the winter conditions on the ground and keep that mud out of the building. Here's some pictures of the outside. This is looking from the north face. You can see the exterior uh, framing is starting to be covered up with the masonry cladding. Uh, it's looking quite nice. Uh, this is from the inside of the building. If you're looking the picture on the left straight ahead, that is the office area, and then this is the learning stair uh, kind of main area. The picture on the right shows, you can see looking through the, the project where the kindergarten uh, wing is going to be located. And I'm kind of standing back in where the um, first makerspace is, and up above me is where the library is. Uh, looking down, this is a couple pictures of the existing classroom wings uh, looking towards the west and this would be the first grade wing here on the right and then a picture uh, looking down the hallway towards the east uh, the, once again to the left is where the maker space is and then looking down towards the classroom uh, this picture is one of my favorites as you can see we're already getting uh, the rough in electrical and the mechanical, and we've actually got drywall going in. And we, uh, this was a picture actually from a couple of weeks ago. Uh, so we actually have the windows and the glazing going in right now, so we could weather tight the building and start putting on some of the interior work. Uh, here's some pictures. Picture on the left is from the very eastern part of the building looking west and then the picture on the right is from the front of the structure you can see we've got cladding going all the way around the uh, exterior metal framing is actually mostly complete at this point uh, we're moving very rapidly just like Ken indicated uh, a picture a week or two away is all it takes to look very different out on the project but it's moving very rapidly we have close to 100 people on site on a daily basis, and things are moving very quickly at Forest Man. At Polk Elementary, uh, putting and foundations for the new building are continuing. We're doing quite a bit of work on putting in this uh, st special structural shop creek on the inside. Uh, we've been doing some of the underground utilities, and actually this next week we're going to be out in the road on 27th Street putting in the underground connections to the sewer and water. And uh, then on the inside of the new building, there's going to be plumbing and some other things, and we're going to start masonry this next week. Uh, looking on the inside of the building, of the old building, you can see the overhead plumbing and fire suppressions going in. That picture on the middle, you, see, you can see the rebar for the shot creek. Uh, it has been drilled in epoxy in, and we're starting to hang the uh, rebar mats that are going to go in there to support 
the new inside concrete structure. Uh, on the outside of the building, you can see the large retaining wall that's going to get back filled up against uh, the picture on the left in front of it where you can see that yellow. That's kind of the outline for the new building. Uh, on the back side where Darwin is standing right there on the right, that's the upper floor where the gymnasium and the cafeteria and other parts of the building that's going to be facing to the east are going to be located. Um, this is from the uh, picture on the left. It's from the dirt dungeon where you can see we put in the pier rebar and we're starting to put the large verticals for the uh, supports on the shot tree. And the picture on the right, you can see the outline of what the new classroom wings are following around that yellow. And then in between it, in between those two wings, you can see that's where the playground access will be out to the left. And once again, to the left is that upper story where the uh, gymnasium and kitchen and other support structures are going to be on the building. Quite a bit of work going on. It's If you're driving by, you will see a lot of people out on site, a lot of material and a lot of equipment moving along. Uh, pictures, you can see the underground storm drain being done. And then the pictures on the right, you can see uh, quite a bit of area where we have stocked up for the lumber interior to redo the roof and redo the roof structures in the old building. I'm Tito Smith. So uh, a lot of work has been done the last month. The bids have been completed. Uh, seven responsive bids were received. Contract is underway with Hughes Construction. We did have the groundbreaking in September, which was a very nice function. And construction has started out on the site right now. So um, just a couple quick pictures. These are my favorite pictures, the picture in the middle especially. You should always have a pink tutu and a hard hat uh, on site. And it should always be a little girl. So uh, it was nice to see the pictures of the teachers as well as the students at the groundbreaking. It was a very nice event. It was very nice to see the descendants of uh, Dr. Smith there uh, who presented as well. And here's some pictures of the students and the teachers at that event. Uh, the one other picture that I wanted to see that uh, Ken had mentioned, that I kind of snuck in here. This was taken yesterday afternoon. So day before yesterday, we started demolition on the project. And as of yesterday afternoon, we're about 75% demolished right now. What's left standing right now is the gymnasium and the cafeteria building. And you can see the library is still kind of standing as of yesterday, um, over the next couple of weeks, we're going to be removing all of this debris. And then they're going to be starting with earthwork excavation on where the new location is so we can get some footings and foundations in before the weather starts changing. That's uh, the presentation to date. Are there any questions? Anyone online have a question for Chris? I've got a quick question. Go ahead, Susan. I was just wondering. Yes, please. On, on Horace Mann, what is our target yes. date for completion? So the, the building will be complete next summer. Uh, we have to complete the building and start the demolition of the old building the second school gets out next May because we have to complete the parking lot and the fire lane in order to get the certificate of occupancy next summer and then at that point once we start the demolition on that complete that the students can move into the new building next summer and then we will finish demolishing the existing building and remove it and put it in the playground and the whole project is scheduled to complete next October, November, including the playground, but the school will be ready for occupancy in August. That's great. Did that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Thanks, Chris. You're welcome. Any other questions? I guess not. Um, 
How long okay. is it, Nancy? How long is it going to take to do TO Smith? So right now our tentative completion date is late spring, early summer of 2022. Uh, that's going to depend on how the weather works this summer. Fortunately, we we moved up the date a couple weeks because we have to use under contract rather quickly. Uh, we're working on getting some of the utilities out of way out of the way and how things go this fall um, is going to determine how quickly we move. But right now we're tentative for completion uh, May, June of 2022. Well, while we're at it, what about Polk? Polk will be completed end of June of 2022 as well. Okay. I just have one more. <laughs> yes. One more quick question. Have you guys had anyone um, tested positive for COVID? Any of your workers? So there have been some positive tests, um, isolated tests. We have not had any reports of new tests for several months at this point. Um, we do require the contractors to report testing um, as of right now. Uh, most of our concerns have been with subcontractors. For example, we had one particular subcontractor, the Shankreet crew before they came to the site, they had crews that tested positive and uh, they had to shift a different crew over, which caused a couple weeks of delay for them getting out on the site. But in terms of crews that have been on site reporting testing, we have not had any positive testing for some time. Okay, well, that's good, thank you. Well, the supply chain has been a little tricky, but we're monitoring it literally every week with both the trades and the supplies and the supply chain. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Yes, no. Thank if, you, Chris. If not, thank you very much for the opportunity. If you have any questions, contact Kim and we can provide whatever we need. So I can't tell if Natalie is online yet. She is. Oh, she is. Okay. So Natalie Gordon from the uh, state office will, um, I guess her and JM are both online to present us with their annual school band trust training. I'm just here to support Natalie. And okay. if you have any questions, and Natalie, you go for it. Thank you. Um, first of all, I want to thank you for having me. And second, I want to thank you for your fabulous district staff. Um, JM and Nalita especially make this district so easy to work with. And your board has taken responsibility for this program, and that makes all the difference. So I'm going to quickly go through... Um, the things that you have to be trained on every year, but I'm going to focus on what's new this year because there's some additional responsibilities that as a board you're going to need to take on. So, oh, I don't, sorry, I'm trying to figure out how to change screens. <laughs> I'm just going to do that. Okay, sorry. Um, so remember that the local school board is the adjudicator and protector of the school and trust funds. Um, these funds are intended to benefit the public school children of Utah in perpetuity. They just announced the distribution for next year, um, and it's going to be $92 million. So it's increasing again from this year's distribution of $88 million. Um, the distribution is figured on the October count for the prior year. So the money that the students in your schools have right now is from the October count in 2019. Mm -hmm. So don't, you don't need to worry about this year's count ruining things for next year. It's going to be two years before we see the effects of this year's count ruining, not ruining things, but requiring a little bit more oversight from Zane and your board to make sure that the funds go where the students are. 
Um, here are eight board responsibilities that are in code and rule, and um, one of them is new. So as you know, you're required to train all school, school community council members and board members, make sure that that training is provided. You're required to read and approve the school land trust plans, assure compliance with state law and board rules, provide information and data to councils so they may complete their work, provide annual reports to councils related to digital citizenship and school safety. Um, you are required to disperse the funds to schools for adherence to their approved plans. And you're also um, required to approve the election timelines for your schools. So the, the rule on elections is that they could be held either in the spring before the school year gets out with parents that are going to have students the next year being able to participate or in the first few weeks of school in the fall. And actually, um, your local schools should be making sure that you guys are okay with when they're holding their elections. And then finally, this is the new one. In the past, we have not had anywhere in the rule that said that anyone needed to read the final reports. So we were reading the final reports, and I'm sure that you and your district staff were reading the final reports, but the new rule requires that you, your district staff present the results from the final reports to you in a board meeting. Um, the rule says before January 31st, but we'll see a little bit later that final reports can be completed up until February 5th. So we're gonna seek to have the board change that date to February 28th. So when you're approving the plans, the local board should make sure that the money is being spent to meet the critical academic needs and that it directly impacts the instruction of students and improves academic excellence. In looking at that, we're actually gonna get down into the rule. So um, you are the approving entity that's mentioned in the rule here, and you're required to review the plan to confirm that it contains academic goals, an action plan, a measurement, and specific expenditures focused on student academic improvement to implement those goals. Those areas are very clearly outlined in the plan um, template on our website. And so when we see these academic goals with a measurement and an action plan, we know that the local board's involved and that schools are actually going to use this money to make a difference. And that is exactly what we love. Another thing is that you, this is new, um, as an improving entity, you need to determine whether their plan is consistent with your pedagogy programs and curriculum. So if um, we had a district once that had just um, bought new math, soft, um, new math curriculum for their entire district and a school wanted to buy a different math curriculum and implement that, that what is what they, the community council wanted to do. And the district said, hey, you know what? That is not consistent with our curriculum. And so they said, please come back with a math goal that works within our programs. And they did, and everyone lived happily ever after. <laughs> um, so this is um, the appropriate use of the funds. And honestly, your staff and your board is where the rubber meets the road for appropriate use of funds. So it says that the council, in collaboration with you, the approving entity, reviews school-wide assessment data annually to make sure that the money is being used for data-driven and evidence-based ways to improve outcomes, consistent with the goals in the teacher and student success plan. So when the teacher and student success plan came out, they got rid of the school improvement plan. The school improvement plan used to be designed by your school community council and it guided what your school land trust plans needed to have in them. So now they use the teacher and student success plan to guide what your school land trust plans have in them. 
And then you also need to make sure that, that your schools know the priorities of your board so that they, um, can inter they can integrate your priorities with their goals. Um, this is something that we've talked about before, but it's just a reminder. We already know that the appropriate use needs to make sure that it's measurable, academic outcomes. But then we also allow behavioral interventions, but the behavioral interventions cannot be a standalone goal. The law requires that every goal be an academic goal with a measurable academic achievement. So when someone comes and says, you know what, we really want to implement this behavior program at our school, it can be done as part of the school and trust plan. You just need to tell us how that behavior program is going to work with the parts, other parts in your goal to improve academic performance in a measurable way. Um, this is brand new and it's really, um, it puts a lot of responsibility on our local boards. Um, and that's really where I think it should be. So as always, the expenditures need to have a direct impact on the instruction of students in the areas of critical academic need and consistent with your academic priorities. But then there's this list and this list is from state board rule on um, curriculum and assessment. So your responsibility is to make sure that the plans focus on English, language arts, mathematics, or science, and for high school, also those things, and increasing graduation rates and promoting college and career readiness. So those are the main areas that the school and trust program should focus on. This is the list of things that you can't use the money for. It has not changed. You guys do a fabulous job with this. But this then talks about if a school wants to use their funds for something other than that list, how they can get, how can, they can do this. And this came about because we had a school in a small district that asked to use their funds for some PE equipment so that they could teach all of the standards in PE. They didn't have the rackets that they needed to teach the badminton standards. And so when they asked if they could use it, our immediate answer was, that's not allowed. But then we looked at it and we thought, local boards should be able to make the decision if that's their most critical need. And so, if a school is demonstrating appropriate progress and achievement consistent with your academic priorities and the list that we just went over, English, math, science, um, graduation rates, college and career readiness, if they're doing that, then they can address another academic goal. The academic goal needs to be in accordance with the core standards. So that school saying, we need badminton rackets. Badminton is part of the core standards for junior high PE. And then it needs to talk about how the action plan for the goal is data-driven, evidence-based, and has a direct impact on the instruction of students. So with that badminton goal, we needed to see a pre-assessment and a post-assessment so that we could tell that there was improvement. And so that was the measurement that we looked for. And finally, um, they need to say what the data is that is um, having money be spent for this secondary purpose and what the measurement's going to be. So they need to talk about why this is an academic need and how they're going to do the measurement. And that is something that you are responsible to make sure they do because we don't know your school's TSSA plans. We don't look at your school's um, assessment data. And so you'll be able to look at a school and say, hey, you know what? This school has a math goal because that's their critical need. This school's doing great in math, but they really do need some PE equipment or um, some maps for social studies or something else that 
doesn't fall in that original list, and then make sure that they're using it in a way to improve academic achievement that's measurable. Do you guys have any questions about that? This is a good place to ask for questions. No, I don't think we, there is any. Okay, good. let me keep moving then. So we have changed our timeline for this year because we are getting a new computer program. And if any of you have ever had to work with the current programming, you'll understand that there's a lot of glitches. So it was decided to bring our programming in-house to the USBEIT team. And they are currently preparing the programming for us to begin using it on January 1st. So just like normal, on October 20th, schools are required to have their council membership submitted online, their principal assurance submitted online, and their school website updated. They used to be required to have their final report completed by October 20th. But one of the benefits of this new program is instead of having someone from the district enter in expenditures for the program for every school by every object code, instead, we're going to be able to pull that data from the data that the district already submits to the Utah Public Education Finance System. The problem with that, and it's not a problem, the challenge with that is that that data is not public until January 15th. So final reports will start in January and be done February 5th. That's when they need to be reviewed, approved by the district. We will review a sample of those for compliance with rule and law. Um, we will also review a sample for um, was the money spent according to the approved plan? So final reports that used to be due in October, 20, in October are now due in February. That also means that the carryover report that we supply to the schools and to the district is not going to be available until after January 15th. So in the past, we've gotten that to you earlier, but now it will be January 15th. Um, as always, your district will select the due date for the upcoming year plan, and your plans need to be completed, approved by you, and ready for our section to review them for compliance by May 15th. The monkey wrench in all of this is that our website's going to be down starting November 1st until January 1st is what we anticipate for data migration. So in that time, if any of your schools have amendments that they want to make or plans that they want to refer to, they will not be able to do that on our website. They will um, have to um, instead submit the amendment to your team on paper, have your team present it to you to make sure that it gets approved, and then send it to us on paper where, where we will keep track of it. And after we're back online, someone will enter it. It's probably going to be me. I will enter it. So that's what we're doing with our timeline, and that's brand new. Natalie, Another thing, sorry. Natalie, um, I just want to interject so everyone knows, all of those updated dates have already been incorporated into our Ogden School District Land Trust timeline that all of our administrators have access to on our Administrator Year of the Glance document. And um, in our biweekly communicator that was sent out from our superintendent today to all admins, um, a notice of updates in the timeline were mentioned there and asked our administrators to go and check that out. We are also, we're also printing out all of the land trust plans right before the state website goes dark so we can support our schools when they want to expend their funds and they need to double check. So um, we are supporting them in that process. And just so you know, our election time for community councils has traditionally and is continued to be in the fall of the, each year. JM, you guys are doing such an amazing job. We should just have you train all the other LEAs and then you guys could all get each other's great ideas and everyone would work as well as you guys. Thank you so much. The last thing that I want to share with you that's new is we've also brought um, 
the resource part of our website online to be part of the schools.utah.gov address instead of our own URL. So you can reach us now at schools.utah.gov forward slash school land trust. The website is going to redirect for the next year um, just so we have long enough to train everybody. And your district does a fabulous job training your councils, but we will also be um, providing WebEx training for councils on October 13th and October 28th from 6 to 8 in the evening. We will have, um, both evenings will be the same program. We'll have an introduction to school community councils. We'll have um, a class that Paula will teach on the responsibilities of the chair and vice chair of your council. And then for the last hour, we will do a sharing session with schools and principals and school board members to see what's working and how things are going in different schools. When we ask for our suggestions, that's what we get the most is please just share with us how other schools are doing this. So we just want everyone to know that they're not in a vacuum and that we can all share our great ideas. I appreciate working with you. Do you have any questions? Anyone? I do. Go ahead, um, Susan. Hi. I, on your PowerPoint uh, about increasing student achievement, and you looked at English, language arts, math, and science. I missed uh, what it was that is needed for high school. Okay, so for high schools, another thing that they can spend their money on besides those four things are to increase graduation rates or to improve college and career readiness. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to just do a quick shout out to uh, JM and Nalita for the fantastic job they do of organizing things on the district level to make it easier for schools and principals to do what needs to be done for these reports. It's, it's a wonderful job that they do. And so thank you. Yeah, I second that. Oh. <laughs> um, one thing that Ogden's doing that we borrowed is um, last year, JM and Nalita started meeting individually with principals to help them write their plans correctly. And so I am now going to be meeting with any district that wants just in their principals meeting to kind of go over the same information. This is what your goal statement should look like. This is what your measurements should look like. Your action plan can be a bullet list. Um, and it really is their example that's making things better for every district in the state. Well, thank you, Natalie. We really appreciate the time that you've taken to train us and give us information on the any updated changes. Thank you, and please know that you can contact us whenever you have a question or concern. We appreciate you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Natalie. Okay. Now we have some exciting news. We'll turn time over to Zane <laughs> and Dale on our bond sale. Thanks, Joyce. Um, and I'm just going to turn the time to Dale Okerlund. We had a very successful bond sale um, a few days ago, and uh, Dale is here to give you all the scoop on that. Thank you. And when he's done, if we have any questions, Thanks. we're happy to take those. Good evening. Um, I should have thought to send Zane an electronic copy, so uh, he's seen the numbers, but uh, he doesn't have in front of him what we've got. Um, let me just uh, quickly review this and then see if you have any questions. There's certainly no action called for here. This is a report. 
uh, to you of the results of the bond election. Uh, if you go in the book I, booklet I gave you to page two, uh, this is a general look at interest rates over the past decade following treasury bonds. You can see that we are at or very near all-time lows. Uh, the next page does the same thing for tax-exempt bonds. You see you know, uh, 11 geo index rate and, and uh, the 20 geo index rate. That just compares because one's tax exempt, the other one's taxable. It's the same type of information. You can also see very close to historic lows in the recent time. Uh, in a more detailed way, on page four, you can see uh, a quantitative presentation. Uh, reflecting what things were like uh, a year before the bonds were sold uh, back in April, uh, May, June, July, August, and then on the date of sale. Those are graphed over there. Uh, the um, uh, that orange line kind of in the middle of all those other lines, orange-ish line is, is uh, where, uh, uh, where that yield curve fell for the municipal market index, which is, once again, just an indicator uh, in general terms of the shape of the yield curve, which is how rates go up as the maturities are longer. Is that the rust, kind of the rust color? Line? Pardon me? Is that kind of the rust color line? Is that what you're... I'm sorry, I couldn't hear oh, you. Oh, is that the rust, the rust color? <laughs> yes. Yeah. The, 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 uh, no, that one's June. It's this uh, uh, more yellowish orange one that's okay. in the middle of those other four. Okay. Yeah, and you can see the, uh, as you go out to 15 years, none of these rates is really even close to one and a half percent. I mean, it, these are all extremely low rates. On pages five and six, you will see just some printed market chatter from the day um, uh, on the 22nd when the bonds were sold. Uh, give you a little bit of idea of who else was in the market, uh, which way the market was trending and so on. Uh, I won't uh, go over that in any detail unless you want to. The, uh, uh, on page seven, you can see the rating on your bonds. If the bonds had been sold without the state guarantee, uh, you would have had a AA3 rating. You have that as what we call an underlying rating, <coughs> and the state uh, school bond guarantee provided a AAA rating for the bonds. So that's the, the credit quality reference there that the market is looking at. Um, we received 14 bids, which is exceptionally high. That reflects um, intensely strong demand relative to the supply of tax exempt paper in the market last week. Next week, it'll probably be a little different. A lot of people are trying to get their uh, bonds sold before the election. So next week will actually be an all-time record in volume coming into the market, about 23 billion. It's more typical to have five to seven billion in a week. Um, so what does TIC mean? TIC is an abbreviation for true interest cost, which is a time weighted um, evaluation of the different inter of the different yields in each maturity of the bonds aggregated to an overall rate for the bond issue. It's a close approximator of your total cost of borrowing uh, if you leave the bonds unrefunded or unredeemed to the 15 years. Uh, and that, these are the four bids you can see the winner was slightly over 1.15% in the TIC. The, uh, 
the uh, lowest and worst bid was about 1.4%, uh, so a difference there of 25 or so basis points, or a basis point is one one hundredth of a percent of interest. And you can see the cover bid was, was out by about two basis points. So the winner did leave a little bit on the table that way. Um, and you had a, a very intense test of the market. Uh, then the next page shows the details of the, the, uh, the bid price and the couponing. Doesn't show only the winners shows the yields. I'll explain a little bit about that in a minute. Um, but the, uh, you can see all the bids there and what the detail looked like. Then the financing summary, it shows the sources and uses. So you have 30 million of par. Uh, the reoffering, the net reoffering premium was a little over $4 million. So your proceeds uh, in gross are a little over 34 million. You have some transaction costs and an underwriter's discount, which is also a transaction cost. But that's money that you will never receive. That's the difference between what the underwriter pays you for the bonds and what they charge the investors for the bonds. And that's how they get paid. So uh, your costs of issuance are um, a fraction of 1% there. And then you see a description of um, the average coupon, the net interest cost. And then to your question, Joyce, the true interest cost is explained there at the bottom of page 10. Mm -hmm. Uh, just what that is and how it's calculated. There's also then an average life, which is the point at which you've paid back half the principal. So, uh, uh, or with this much premium, you've paid back sort of half the notional amount of bonds at 7.9 years. Uh, the call feature, these bonds are redeemable, uh, but only in December of um, 2030, and you can redeem them at par. There's not a lot of juice in the refunding because you'll see the coupons I get to in a minute if we get to that point. The market's changed about that, and then you see the rest of those there. The detailed numbers then are in the portrait pages following that discussion. Uh, you will see a sources and uses, um, which we've already put in the text. Then page two shows a debt service schedule. So you'll see over the next 15 years, the, par, the principal amount of bonds that will be repaid in each year the amount of the, 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 the contract coupon, the interest that that generates, and then the total for each fiscal year during that time to repay the bonds. Um, then if you turn to the pricing page, you will see uh, what happened with the premium. The out to the out the non-redeemable bonds, the bidders preferred a high coupon to those bonds. They all put fives on them. The yield column is your actual interest cost. And the difference that that works out is in the dollar price and the price column, in the, the, the price and then the dollar price. So what happens is if if say the guy a guy that buys the, the, the 2024 bonds, he gets a 5% coupon, but he's only getting a 20 basis point yield. So he has to pay more than a million five fifty to buy that bond. He has to pay a dollar and 17 cents for every dollar of bond he gets to make up for that difference between yield and coupon. And that's why you have that $4 million premium. That's the aggregate of all that. You'll see out in the far end, there's discounts where they're paying less than a dollar for some of the bonds. So that $4 million is a net number uh, to all of that stuff. Um, and 
Then uh, in the back, I have included the text of the rating report of Moody's Investor Service, where you will see their analysis of the district and its finances, its tax base, uh, the things that concern them. If you look, um, uh, if you look on page two, uh, halfway down the the uh, page there you'll see a blue heading that says credit strengths. These are the things that Moody's is telling people who read them, typically investors, what they think is strong, which is you have a growing tax base and you have stability from uh, uh, Weber State and government related institutions as part of your community. Challenges are expected deficits in 20 and 21, that is you'd be dipping a little into your fund balance. They don't like that. Um, uh, Long-term trend of declining enrollment. It's a bit of a hobby horse with them. Mm -hmm. And below average socioeconomic measures for your property valuation and, and your credit rating. So those are all challenges from their perspective. Um, but do they look at the challenges do they outweigh the strengths or? Well, they, they consider it all when they gave you the double A3 rating. It all goes into the mix. Okay. And then they give you that number. And then it says factors that could lead to an upgrade. In other words, things that could happen or in some cases that you could do or decide that would cause the bond rating to go up. And they've uh, put four things there. Structurally balanced operations supporting an improved financial position. That means income is more than outgo and you're adding to fund balance on a sustained basis. That's what that means. Okay, That's the first one. The second one is strengthened local resident wealth and income metrics. The people here get richer and their incomes go up. That's beyond your control. Uh, meaningful expansion of the tax base. So if you had a lot of property being built here or coming off redevelopment roles, such as happened earlier this year, or, or you um, uh, annexed half of Weber County or something, that's what would affect that. So that's also largely beyond your control. The fourth one is trend of increased enrollment and or significant decline in charter attendance which you may have some limited control over. So the, only the first thing there is really solidly in your control. Uh, and then things that could lead to a downgrade would be a deterioration in financial position, that is you keep drawing on your fund balance, a prolonged trend of enrollment decline, or a sharp tax-based contraction, or a considerable weakening of socioeconomic profile. So as you can see, some of that's in your control, most of it is not. But that's what they're looking at that could affect the rating of the district. And you might find it interesting to just look through that. Um, that concludes what I had to say, but I'm perfectly happy to take any questions or to give Zane any time he wants to come in. Anybody here have questions? Anyone online have questions for Dale? This is Jeremy. Go ahead, Jeremy. Okay. Um, Hi, Jeremy. Hey. <laughs> so, um, are, are the names of the 14 bidders public? Yeah, they're yes. in this book. Yeah, they're part of your public oh, record. Okay. Yeah. And, um, So R. W. Baird bid one point one five four zero three eight the TIC, but in our packet it's one point one five 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 nine six. So there's a difference of there's a small uh, difference. I can point uh, one. Uh, that's an excellent question, and the answer to that question is. When when we put 
out the bonds to bid, we have a maturity structure that puts a particular number of dollars into each year to be repaid as principal. So if you, if you were to look, say, on page two of, of, uh, uh, of the handout I gave, uh, there, there was a, a, a principal amount due in 2021, next June, and then there was a little bit in each year thereafter. And what happens is we have to guess at how they're going to coupon their bid, what, what contract interest rates they're going to bid. And we also have to guess at what the yields are going to be. And if they bid differently, which they almost always do, uh, we like to rebalance that so that we're using the exact amount of resource that you have available in 2021. So if, for example, the premium is high, which we expected, we plan for that because you're going to have a greater cash flow on the interest expense. And we plan for that, but uh, if, say, for example, they had put in a par bid where they didn't coupon it like this, and they had just they had had a coupon of say, you know, one point uh, one four instead of a coupon of five, we would have had to put a lot more principal in that year to soak up the expected debt levy resource that's already been levied, and that would mean we, of the thirty million we have to move bonds around. We would have had to take bonds out of later years and put them in the first year. Well, because that didn't come in exactly the way we modeled it, and it almost never does, we reserve the right to jigger that around and impose the new result on the bidder. And we had to do that in a very minor way. And when we did that, we put just a few bonds, uh, probably wasn't more than 60,000 or so, uh, from early maturities, probably 22 and 23, into the late maturities. And that has an effect on the TIC. And that's why it's different. It had nothing to do with competing for the bonds. It had to do with our readjustment of the par values to balance all of that, to fit into the models that we've been working on with Zane. So it's pretty technical, but that's why. So we basically made that change when we when we rebalanced the debt service uh, to meet your resources, and we always do that. That's a that's a routine practice. In your in your packet, did you mention the spread and how that what that told us? Uh, yeah, we talk about the we talk about the. Um, the spread in um, there's a discussion on the underwriter's discount on page 11. The method of sale we have chosen to use here, competitive sale, means that we have no control over the spread. The, the winning bidder might have a very large spread. He might have a little tiny skinny spread. We have no say over that because we're making them compete on a TIC basis. So we do not control their profit whatsoever. Uh, I've, I've had bids this year where that spread was $17,000. I've had transactions where that spread might be $200,000. Yeah, Dale, I think Jeremy's question is the difference between the low bid and the high bid. Is that what you're talking about, Jeremy? Are, are you, Jeremy, are you talking about underwriters' compensation, or are you talking about the difference between to, the winning bid and the worst bid? Yeah, I'm talking about the, the TIC submitted by each bidder. Oh, the, the, oh, those spreads. Well, the the um, each each bidder submits a bid that is the lowest cost where they want to own the bonds. And we just pick the winner. 
Right. So, you know, when Ken and Chris present their construction bids, sometimes they'll come with a very, very close amount, which means there's, you know, there's high demand. Um, so I'm just wondering if the spread, this spread tells you the same thing for bonds. It essentially does. Yeah. If we had had, say, three bids and the cover bid was, was and the winning bid was this and the cover bid was like 1.25, that would be kind of a loose, sloppy market. This is showing a relatively tight market, and I've seen tighter markets. I've seen them where sometimes the top five bids were all within a single basis point, where the, it was extremely close. Uh, it just... But but we have no control over that. But this does. Does it tell you anything? Does it tell you anything that Baird was the third bid to come in relatively early, and you know the the remaining eleven bids that came after it didn't weren't even well didn't didn't beat it. No, that's incidental. That uh, that didn't predict anything. That, that just happened. That, that's a that's an incidental item to the process. Thanks. That I really enjoyed watching that real time. Uh, it's pretty it's pretty fun, isn't it? Did we lose Zane and maybe are we still on with them? Okay. We just saw lost sight of these screens. I'm not sure, Dale, if yours. Uh, I, I'm, getting the the, district logo. I'm getting the district's logo on yeah. the screen. So. I'm good. Thank you very much. Okay. Anyone else have any questions, Susan? I just had a quick question. When these bids come in, is it, I'm sure they have a certain block of time that they need to have them submitted. Is it like one day or do they have the week? Well, what happens is we start showing them the preliminary, the, the offering documents about a week ahead. We have a service that does that and blasts it out to all the bidders in the nation. Um, and they decide if they want to bid, how they want to bid, based on parameters that we have previously set, which they cannot change. So the only thing they control is the interest rate and the price they pay. And we tell them you can't pay less than par. You can't pay less than 30 million, even if you want to, because we, we're not going to entertain that bid. Uh, they then submit their bids electronically, also to a, a firm that we have, have contracted with to do this service uh, on a one-time basis for you. We do it each time new. And they just hit a button on their desk and send their bid into that. And that, those guys have a computer that it tabulates them all, evaluates them, checks them to make sure they're all within the parameters, and shows us what they rank. And it happens, most of the bids come in in the last two minutes. Oh, we my have goodness. A, we have a moment in time, 9.30 a.m. Mountain. We previously announce it, and the bids come in. Hmm. Uh, if you looked for a bid on the bid screen two hours ahead, you'd see nothing. Hmm, okay. there, there wouldn't be anything there. In fact, we were shocked on this one when we got a bid about 20 minutes early, one. Uh, that, that doesn't usually happen. I've often seen it where there are one or two or even no bids three minutes before the deadline. Huh. Because they're, what they're doing is they're watching the market and they tweak their spread. They increase or decrease their compensation because every dollar they decrease it improves their bid. And they, they don't usually change the rates they bid. They, they tweak their compensation. And it all depends on their pre-sale, how, how many customers they have interested in the bonds. Hmm, so it's, it's quite a complex process, but it, it literally comes down typically to the last 30 seconds before the deadline. Thanks. Wow, sounds exciting. Uh, it's kind of fun to watch. Yeah, it's a fun process. Dale, isn't it also true that they they can submit a bid and pull it and resubmit 
as long as they get everything done before the 930 deadline. Oh, yes, and we see that happen. Sometimes they'll pull a bid, put it back in. Sometimes they'll pull a bid and not come back in. Mm -hmm. um, that doesn't happen too often, but uh, uh, yeah, they, they can do uh, all of that stuff. Now, the negotiated sale process is quite different. It doesn't work like this, but that's how the competitive bidding process does. And both approaches are quite legitimate. We, we analyze which one it would be the best to use for each bond sale you do. Oh, sorry, one more thing. Would, did you see the same bidders or how would you compare this to the Nebo bond sale that was that this was preceded by? Uh, that sale was very similar in terms of the structure. That is, it's 15-year bonds with, with the last five years being prepayable. Uh, and it was smaller. They were selling 20 million, not 30. Uh, their credit rating is a bit higher than yours, and they have two ratings, which for that size is not really relevant. That gets relevant if you get up above 50 million. And uh, they were also selling in a little better market. Uh, they were, they sold about a month before you did, or a little more than a month. And they had 16 bids, which is also extraordinary. You had 14. Um, so the sales are pretty equivalent, except the absolute results, which were probably about 25 basis points difference. But that's mostly the market moving as a whole over the month not anything to do in particular with the individual securities. D does that answer your question? Thank you, yes. Okay. And so now what is the timeline when these funds will actually be at the district for use? Uh, the closing is scheduled for October 15. Okay. And on that morning, the underwriter, they've already sent you 2% of the par, $600,000, it's in the bank. They'll send the rest of the money, um, and, and then we have a way of electronically of sending them the bonds, and those change hands on that. Day. And that's when you will have the money uh, to uh, invest and then to spend uh, on construction purposes. Okay. And so, Zane, I guess this is for you. When do you expect the final um, portion of the bond to be sold? Uh, we're planning on in a year. In a year? Okay. Yep. But we'll be monitoring from month to month what the cash flow looks like. If it looks like we're going to need it sooner than later, uh, we could do it sooner than later. Right now, I'm thinking about a year from now. Thanks. Thanks. Any other questions for Dale or Zane? Well, I was just, I need something clarified. Um, I was just reading here and it says, we regard the coronavirus outbreak as a social risk under this framework. I mean, is that why, you know, next year that'll figure into this and... Is that, I don't know, on page uh, Which two, page are you on? On Moody's Investment Service. Okay, what page of their report? It's the, uh, page two. Okay. It says, this situation surrounding the coronavirus is rapidly evolving, and the longer-term credit impact will depend on both this, uh, you know, the severity and the duration of the crisis. I mean... Well, basically what they're saying is if the economy collapses or changes a lot... Uh, and it hurts your ability to repay the bonds, they'll downgrade you. That's what they're saying. Okay. And they just don't know if that's going to happen. Okay. That, they're, they're hedging their bets over coronavirus. And that's out of our... Yeah. That's, that's exactly what's going on there. So prior to Moody's actually doing that rating, mm -hmm. we, have a, we have a conference call with them. And uh, they talk to us about our financial statements, about the information that we've shared with them. And one of the things that they asked about was, how are you dealing with coronavirus? Okay. And uh, 
because they're concerned that because of the virus, we may uh, may not be able to meet our financial obligations. Fortunately, we have a plan. We were able to give them assurance that that this coronavirus thing is not going to affect our ability to repay these bonds. Wonderful. Okay. Yeah, yeah, they're also interested in operational challenges, and uh, so they want to know. You know, are you doing online learning? Are you having in classroom learning? Do you have a mix? What's your backup plan if you have to change? They ask all that stuff. It was pretty in intense. They were asking some great questions mm -hmm. uh, to get out what it is we're doing. There wasn't really a lot of fluff that I could give. I mean, they wanted the details, right? I mean, by fluff, I mean that thirty thousand foot. They wanted they want specifics. Yeah, they wanted ground zero. Yeah, and they did, <laughs> and and they they were thorough, and uh, but that impressed me. I thought, you know, good on them. They're looking at that. They're protecting their investments, and it is good. And I was glad that the superintendent could be there for that conversation. I wandered by at the right time. Mm -hmm. Zane, Zane let me know that they were meeting, and uh, yeah. The other stuff, yeah. Dale and Zane, I was glad you were able to field all the nitty gritty on the deep financials, right? So. Oh, I feel good about it. Okay. Yeah, okay. That's good. Uh, let's see. Did I did I leave Jeremy a book? Jeremy, uh, we it, need one for Jennifer. Jennifer too. Yeah. Okay. So Dale, and, uh, if you could, uh, Dale, if you could electronically send me what you just passed out. I'll make sure they get a copy too. Okay, thank you. Very good. We'll yeah. get it in board. Oh, I'll have Mark send that to you. Did you take a copy? Any other questions? Oh, thank you. Good. Thank you, Dale. Well, thank you, Zane. Congratulations. Uh, you uh, you're borrowing money at a uh, at a very strange time, uh, and the. The cost of borrowing the money is just really low. Uh, that's, uh, uh, I guess, the bigger concern now is construction inflation and not interest cost. Mm -hmm. So that's. I don't see uh, that. I've seen a lot of things <laughs> in my in my career, and and lately the interest expense has just been very modest. Good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Chance to work with you. Thanks, Dale. Okay. Yeah. I will turn some time over to the superintendent to talk a little bit about the board master plan in. And I'm hoping the delay. My screen should be sharing, but it's not. Let me try again. Sorry, we can't share your screen, it says. Let's try one more time. We just have to keep looking at Zane. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm hurrying as fast as I can. I'm sorry about that, I can't. There it goes. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair and Madam Vice President, excuse me. Um, as, as I introduced and began uh, a discussion, uh, the last time we met as a board talked about what is what is this master plan? What are we? What do we hope to accomplish? What do we hope to see? What do we hope to do? And by the year 2030, right? So as we're taking a 10-year look, um, but engaging uh, the Board of Education in such a way that uh, puts you at the, really at the center of that shared governance space as to what that uh, opportunity would look like. So I'm just going to present very, very high level things to consider that the board may want to consider as you look to the future of the Ogden School District. And then we can get into some strategies, some suggestions, some work groups, some topics, and things like that. But at the moment, this is just very, very high level of things to start to, to consider, things that you may want to start giving input or feedback on and or 
suggest a, a course of action or a path moving forward as we consider these, uh, the next few things that I'll present here. Uh, first of all, really what is local board governance, right? And, and I know I'm preaching to the choir because you are the, vo the, the voted uh, board members. Uh, the electorate got together and you have constituents, they voted for you. Uh, but what does that governance look like in a, under a di district structure? And just a few things here, um, and uh, some of this comes out of state law, and I'll get in that in just a moment. Some of it comes out of uh, best practice for local board governance. But as you look at that, that first, and I won't read every word here, but uh, local school boards have that responsibility for what is what is goal setting. When you think about policy making, there's no elected officials closer to the students than you. It's not the state board, although they have a very they're a constitutional partner. For, for statewide education, and they do represent uh, specific district districts. You know, it's not the legislature, it's you. You have the closest policy making ability next to the students, mm -hmm. um, which places you in a wonderful uh, position, wonderful opportunity uh, to have that influence. Uh, when it comes to community involvement, you represent the community, you were voted by the community. You have oversight of some administrative aspects for the individual school districts. Think about budgets, think about land trust. We just talked about that. Uh, think about uh, fiduciary responsibility. How are we spending your dollars? And we had a great conversation already with Dale regarding going out to bonds. Those are those are those are big things. And and again, I'm preaching to the choir, so I, I apologize. But just to, to emphasize the point, uh, your most important responsibility is work with the community to improve student achievement in local schools. Right? We 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 engage you engage uh, families of your local communities uh, to say, hey, what do you want to see for your child? And I've said this before, but we take it all too seriously that we are partnering hand in hand in many ways with raising children. Our partnership was with the family. And when families place that trust in us to help raise their children, it's, it's something we never take lightly. And as a local board, uh, you represent uh, that trust, that connection uh, with what's occurring into the, in the schools as it is also occurring in the homes. Uh, school boards, you get your power from uh, the state, the state law. Uh, if you take a look at that, you got Title 53G, Chapter 4, Part 4, Section 402, which goes into the powers and duties of uh, local school boards. And that, that is, um, that's law. So you have that statutory responsibility under the state law to execute certain powers, certain responsibilities, certain authority. Uh, and of course, uh, we establish policies um, uh, with throughout the district. Some of the, some very specific key points or responsibilities of the school board, you employ the superintendent to help uh, with you and that shared governance, deliver that quality education that we want for our students. You adopt policies, the curriculum, we've made a significant investment, this board has supported and uh, may, made the financial in investment of providing a, a very robust curriculum for students, a resource for teachers to use to maximize learning of students. And of course, as mentioned, the budget. Oversee facility issues, we, we're doing that a lot. We're doing that a lot right now and analyzing what that looks like. Collective bargaining agreements, of course, these are the things that are coming out of negotiations, right? As we work with different uh, employee groups, uh, we reach, uh, you, you hold the key, so to speak, as to what that, uh, whether or not those negotiations are agreed upon or if they need to take a different direction, but uh, again, a weighty responsibility. And this last bullet, you engage the community. You engage the community that you represent, you engage your constituents that voted you in, and, and this is where it kind of gets tricky, balancing the whole needs of the district while representing your constituents, understanding the parts and the whole which is a tremendous responsibility. And so it's, it's through that lens that we look to what does the future hold that I look through when I look to engage the board. What, what do we in that shared governance space want to accomplish in our district over the course of the next several years? Um, to do that, objectives, and these are proposed objectives, right? As we start from where we are at here today in 2020, and it's not that I'm trying to wish 2020 away, Although in many ways I, I will, uh, but we'll see what 2021 holds. But still, what is it, looking past, right? I mean, we can get caught up in so, so much in, in the current that we lose sight of what could be. 
And uh, we don't want to lose sight of that. It's our responsibility to not lose sight of that. But what does it look like long term? So these are just proposed objectives. What would it look like to articulate a master plan uh, for the Ogden School District in that space? Does that include revisiting our mission, vision, and values? It's been it's been a while. I think times have changed and some structures yeah. have changed. And, yep, and we've got them laminated and, and framed. I have one framed in my room, uh, my office. And we live by them. We do. And I'm not suggesting that they're long overdue or otherwise or they're antiquated or outdated, but it always it's healthy to engage one, the board, with those uh, with that mission, vision, and values and, and the community. If I could just interject, sure. uh, because it has been a while that just like we're doing with our policies, yeah. that it does not hurt to go through this and make sure that this is still the direction that right. um, we're seeing, we hope to see the district go in. So, yeah, no, I, thanks, Joyce. Uh, or, or, Madam Vice President, That's okay. uh, <laughs> but you're, you're exactly right. And to that end, uh, why not revisit it? And, and why not revisit it with the community, right? right? And, and to garner uh, that conversation uh, to that end. And that's that third bullet, right? As, as board members uh, having that responsibility per the previous slide uh, to engage the community in that uh, purposeful planning. So I, I just want to make very clear, we, we, we have a very solid, we have a very robust strategic plan. We call it Nexus Elevated. The board's very well aware of that. Uh, to differentiate, this isn't to compete with Nexus Elevated. Nexus Elevated truly is about what are our priorities for this year, what are our objectives, and what what we hope to or and how we hope to accomplish that through our strategies. So that's very much looking at right now. This is what we're focusing on. This is what we're needing to do. Now, those priorities, objectives, strategies can translate from year to year. Sometimes the strategies are going to change as we do it, but it's really the Nexus Elevate is the, the, the tight and loose of what's expected versus what's not and how we operate in the day-to-day -day space within our school district. And um, anywhere from our school plans, you know, the school success plans, we've talked about that. you got the land trust plans, very much tied to what we're doing right now in our schools, uh, which is great. So, and systems accreditation is a big part of that. Uh, which is more to follow on that. But but our priorities in that space are our, our anchors that we've identified is we're, when you think about the history of public education, what's mattered? Academics. What else has this mattered? Social emotional learning, right? The whole child needs a whole child. And talent development, how we grow and support those um, that we that we rely on to provide the academics and social emotional learning for students. And so those, those, those are core, those are fundamental, those are the pieces, that, and we've, we have very specific parties, objective strategies. What I'm proposing, or what, what I think as a board we, we should consider, or at least have the conversation regarding, is yes, this is Nexus Elevated. What does it look like? What is the board's effort in engaging the community in, in terms of reaching out to, you know, the future? What does is, what is the future uh, state hold? So they're, they're, like I said, it's not, uh, the concept isn't to compete, but to complement, to identify, um, what that looks like in terms of, again, what that board role is, um, and and how we move forward and how we think uh, into the into the, into the future. So, for example, you could right currently this is our vision: empowering excellence through education. We use it in our presentations. We use it in our uh, we use it in our um, correspondence. Uh, you, you've probably seen it in some of my newsletters or district bulletins. It's great. We we use it on our wall. We, yep, it's right there in vinyl letters on our wall. Thank you. It's great. I'm not suggesting it needs to be changed or couldn't be changed, but what would it look like if, if we were to have some, a brainstorming session around, well, around our vision? And that's great. And it's not change for change's sake, but is, is there something that we might want to include maybe a little bit differently to phrase a little bit? Or at the end of the day, could we say, you know what, we're good with that. But again, that's it's been a while, I think, engaging the community, engaging the board on that, saying, hey, what really is that vision? And it, it very, very, very well line up and say, you know what? Nothing needs to change. I mean, that that is a, that is an outcome uh, through that process. Same thing, mission. And then, and I mentioned this. It's even more timely for you know where we're at in 2020, 2021, the academic year. We we need we need to maximize those opportunities for students in a safe, nurturing environment. I mean, that's our mission. Now, could that change given? where we're at today with COVID and the different platforms on how we maximize educational opportunities? Sure. Could it be written a little bit differently? Sure. Could it stay just the same? Sure. 
right? But at least we're having a conversation saying, hey, are these, and weighing them, are, 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 are is this vision, is this mission really capturing for us what, what we want it to, to uh, encapsulate? Values, a little bit longer here, but again, these are the, the values of the Ogden School District uh, with some narrative with each of them, right? So we have instruction, we value our partnerships. Um, truly, we couldn't do it uh, without the partnerships that we have, uh, involvement, uh, innovations, and respect. Again, these values are still values, don't get me wrong. They, they still are values. Or are they worded or are they captured? Would you add, would you change, would you modify? Again, definitely within as, as we view, like even Nexus Elevated, what are the values of this district? What are those core values? And how might they be um, the lens through which we look and the decisions that we make? Um, but anyway, some, some values there. Would we bring in some, uh, uh, some equity uh, aspects to those values? Sure. But that's, again, I just give examples. What, what does that discussion look like? And do, and do these values capture uh, the values of the board um, today and what you would want them to be for the next several years? Just a thought, again, I think uh, it would behoove us to take a look at our facility and land master plan, right? So the district owns uh, a few different properties. Uh, what is the, what's the plan for those properties? How might we look at the different properties and, and uh, create a plan around their use um, as well as facilities? This, I mean, think of it. We just, we're just talking about a bond right now. There'll come a time where we need to talk about another bond. When is that? And for what purpose? And so it would be, this would be an element of that master planning to 2030. What would we want in 2030 for facilities and land use? Now, granted, we're, we're looking forward, we're projecting, but, but how could we be proactive identifying what those uses could be? And like I said, including uh, what would another bond look like? Is it an elementary situation? Is it updating some junior high issues? Is it, what does it look like at, uh, you know, um, anyway, at, at any of our facilities, what does it look like? But to be able to have a very structured conversation around that, and again, engaging the community as part of that conversation with, with the board. And, and with district officials. How would we wanna see that happen? Uh, another one, instruction and learning. If you went back there, I mean, what part of your responsibility is adopting curriculum that's aligned to standards and things like that. We do have in Nexus Elevated, very specific personalized learning efforts that we're planning that, that essentially challenge the what was and furthers our efforts as to what is for us to realize perhaps what could be a little differently in meeting students and their needs where they're at. Um, so that, that, that could be part of that effort. And again, some of that could come right out of Nexus Elevated. We're adopting one-to-one -one initiatives. We have a personalized learning uh, effort underway to, uh, to reimagine perhaps uh, what could be. Um, and we have some, some work group efforts around that, but how would we broaden that once, once we get a little traction, a little more traction with that? And where would the board uh, wanna see themselves in that process? Uh, making those determinations and how we engage the community. Uh, graduation 2030. Uh, this uh, this actually really excites me. Right now we have some second graders out there. That, those are those two top pictures. What would we envision for these two second graders when they reach the point um, in the picture below with those Ben Lohman grads? But what does that look like in 2030? What are they prepared for? Now, there's been a lot of work in the state around this concept of a portrait of a graduate, meaning... If you, if you go through the K-12 system and you graduate, what is, what is that portrait? What is that, that, that ideal that we're aiming for to prepare them for life after high school, uh, preparing them for options? And so for us, uh, really in this space, we've done some portrait of the graduate work ourselves already. It was running somewhat parallel to what the state was doing. And we interviewed several of our recent graduated seniors and things like that. And it, it was really, really telling as the things that worked for them, things they didn't, things that they felt prepared for, things they wish they could have been prepared for maybe a little <laughs> bit differently um, as they were recent graduates. But to that end, what would it look like for us as the Ogden School District to say, hey, you know what, we're gonna, we're gonna partner our efforts with the state who's done Portrait of Graduate. They're working on right now, and we've had several of our own staff, uh, uh, including myself with the Portrait of Graduate at the state level, identify what competencies we want students to have, think of, what they're able to know, do, and, and so forth. Uh, but, but if you can see there, that's just a snapshot of what the State Board of Education um, effort was and is currently under 
portrait of a graduate, but how could that inform, right? How would we engage one, not only the board, but, but the community to say, what do you want for your second grader? By the time 2030 hits, what, do you, what does that look like? And how might we imagine that through how we intentionally plan from, from now to then? Um, and again, identifying, if you walk through some of our, our uh, halls in our elementary schools, you'll see a future class of 2030. Mm. Um, <laughs> makes me feel old every time I see it, but, but I'm excited because I do. I, I go into that classroom, I see the children, I see their faces, and it's like, I want so much for you to be successful. We're going to do all that we can to help prepare you for that sex, success, both, both that ultimate success, you know, throughout life, but also the proximate success or the here and now to be able to say, how do we help you as a second grader? How are we going to make sure that you are gaining the knowledge, skills and, and abilities that you need as you move from second to third grade, third grade to fourth grade and so forth? Of course, not losing sight of the students that we have in the here and now, uh, because we continue to build that out. We're continuing to power excellence through education. There it is uh, in our vision. But at the same time, also purposefully planning um, and being able to adapt and being nimble and providing opportunities for, for this graduation class. Um, but to do, do it through the lens of what, a, what would a master plan look like to be able to get there from here? Um, which speaking of, and, and again, I, I, I can't overstate not to compete and it's not competing with Nexus Elevated. Nexus Elevated is getting us to a great place. It really has defined what it, that roadmap that we need, the here and now, the day-to-day, -day, those operations. And at the same time, much of it would inform uh, in my mind, anyway, um, what it inform how this master planning would look through the board's view and through the community's view um, as we reach out into the future. Thoughts, feedback, suggestions, um, and you don't have to come up with them tonight. You can let it marinate and get back with me on this. But uh, just thinking, just thinking out loud, what uh, what does that future hold, and how does the board, through the lens of shared governance, want to view that? With the community, right. but and not at the thirty thousand foot level, but maybe the twenty five thousand. I so I've given this a little bit of thought um, since it was first brought up, and um, I kind of envisioned some ad hoc committees being established with board representation, district, community, um, to ensure that residents of Ogden are part of this vision um, as the whole city works toward 2030 and beyond. Um, whether it's um, an ad hoc committee for facilities, mm -hmm. technology, curriculum, and academics, and I even thought extracurricular mm -hmm. activities. Um, so just that plus, you know, reviewing the uh, vision, mission, and values of our district uh, that were established a few years ago. So, okay. good. Thank you. Yeah, I like the idea. If you had ad hoc yeah. committees, get all the, you know, even a town hall saying, hey, look, mm -hmm. highly facilitated. Uh, what if would your people feedback know be? ahead of time what we're going to at least discuss, yes. they yep. can come with thoughts, ideas, published agendas. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and to that end, yeah. what? Here, here's a list of the district properties. Here's the current condition of facilities. Mm -hmm. What would your thoughts be if, if, you know, X, Y, and Z, this is what we would consider. And what it, honestly, what would it look like for facilities and land use in 2030? Right. And a group would discuss that and provide oppor opportunity to give feedback and, and brainstorm uh, what that might be. And then, of course, the final decision as elected officials rests with the board. Yeah. Right, as as you look at that, and and you take that advice, you take that counsel, you take that engagement, um, and and you're able to to arrive at a a point where you know you would articulate a course of action and then move forward on executing on that. And obviously, this is not something that um, could all be brought together in January. I mean, this is going to be a process. It's going to take a minute, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's, <laughs> to get there. Right, to get, to get there in a good way. Mm -hmm. I agree with you, Joyce. I, I think it's going, to take, it's going to take some time to really build it out. Um, not to be rushed, right? right? Uh, but to be thoroughly uh, vetted um, with, with a high degree of intentionality. But yeah, it's, it's going to take some time. Yeah. It would take some time.
Well, this is just a little bit of a different thing, but I mean, it kind of reminds me, we've been doing this citizen advisory committee, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and we kind of, when COVID hit, we haven't been meeting right. as much, but the insights that we were getting from the parents that were involved yes. in that, and then we were coming together with United Way, and I mean, it was just, yeah, it's been Several of very the insightful. Partnerships. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a good community representative of the community mm -hmm. to take a look at like vision, mission, values, mm -hmm. right? And brainstorm around and, and offer suggestions okay. there. And I mean, as much as, as much as wordsmithing can sometimes be <laughs> tedious, it needs to be done, right? The value of word uh, in the in in print. Uh, but anyway, a, a, a committee to take a look mm -hmm. and to take a look at that and, and make some recommendations again. Gotcha decision ultimately resting with, resting with the board as to what that might will or, or would eventually look like. I, I guess I'm just looking for a little clarity. So then our Nexus elevated people, um, they're basically using Nexus, or we're using it as a tool to help our students grow and, and become better educated. So what we would be doing then with our the new vision, mission, and values would be separate from these folks, and we'd have our own group of people working on this, or would our Nexus elevated individuals also be helping? So Nexus, uh, if, if I were, and then I can pull it up. But if you take take a look, Nexus elevated is a dynamic document, and, and we did talk early about what it would look like to have, say, a say a goal in 2022 for literacy and graduation. Uh, we're finding um, the rubber really meets the road when we when we start talking about what is a goal this year for graduation? What is the goal this year for literacy? And these are the strategies that we're going to incorporate right now right. to reach that goal, okay. right? So, so it really is, Nexus Elevated is the is the day-to-day -day expectations of how we're going to meet very specific goals, even okay. this year type goals. Right. Um, a lot of, and, and just fully anticipating a lot of what's in Nexus Elevated right now, because it, it is forward thinking, uh -huh. even though it is looking at this year, our, our work around, like, let's, let's use the example of personalized learning, how we're moving into a one-to-one -one space, could be very well part of that. And I would say, would complement that. I would, if I were to interject, I would suggest, you know, our work around personalized learning, although already begun, is going to find its way into what our community wants in 2030. Right. And okay. and we're well on our way in that space. Could it, I mean, could it be informed by something, you know, uh, that might help us think of maybe a little bit differently? I'll say this, with, with that particular objective in Nexus Elevated, it has already changed drastically when it comes to one-to-one -to -one because COVID. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. So what we were hoping to accomplish by 2025, even in terms of devices, mm -hmm. guess what? We're we're there. So to the to that end, how do we then adjust some of, of that effort? Um, and Nexus Elevated really is a dynamic document of, of what it is that we're doing right now to further the work of kids. Right. So yes. I do. I see I, I could see in that space, not as a, a separate, you know, effort, but uh -huh. really is, you know, there's things in Nexus Elevated that's going to inform right, and, and get us to where we need to be by 2030. Okay. I mean, at least, at least in my mind is we're facilitating that. We're, this is the reality. This is the course that we're on right now. People could offer feedback on that as well, but, but the one complements the other. Okay. To say, okay. Got it. All right. Yep. Thank you. I'm proud of how we've handled COVID. Well, with technology and. Yeah, it's, it's been. It's it, it's been it's necessity is the mother of acceleration. And <laughs> and we have definitely the head of the game. <laughs> been accelerated because of necessity. Right. Um, and so, and to be honest, some some funding opportunities that have come mm -hmm. to us because of COVID that you know we didn't have before that has allowed us to do mm -hmm. that. Uh, think of phone book purchases, uh, a hotspot. And devices, right. uh, you know, things that we we received there in terms of grants yeah. that we wouldn't have got uh, before. So anyway, it has accelerated the work. Well, and I think the COVID has also pushed us forward with Nexus Elevated, and also um, another um, 
important need to look at our uh, vision and mission simply because I think with COVID, it's pushed us uh, further ahead in um, our hybrid education. You know, mm -hmm. not all education for all students, I think, will ever again look like it has in the past. And so we're looking at, um, and, and school districts across the nation have been moving in this direction. I think COVID just gave us that push to move a little bit more rapid in uh, looking at education. You know, if I look at education in 2030, it's not going to look like the classrooms that we have today. I think uh, we, you know, we start putting our thoughts around, um, you know, the hybrid, the remote versus in-person and, and all that kind of stuff. So all of that changes as well. A great, great point, and and you're right. It's I think it's been, and I I pulled this one back up. If you see that top picture, it's kind of small, but that you know that's a classroom at, at turn of the century, and uh, I'm always fascinated by the one room schoolhouse. But uh, how different is it today, and how even how much has that been accelerated per COVID? If if you were to take a look at Nexus Elevated, and we are in the process of making some adjustments, we hope to have you know a handful of courses um, that were. Uh, an online option uh, by by a certain year, but uh, at this point now we've got K twelve and and uh, almost well considerably and considerable many secondary classes. You know your ELA math and science, but also your AP uh, concurrent enrollment things like that. Where and, and to that point, uh, board members on the, that you just made, and I, I hate to restate it, but I, I'm just passionate about it. Brick and mortar. Uh, in terms of a, a, a school is is great, but what other what are the other options that are going to come out of this mm -hmm. when it comes to personalized learning and opportunity? We've seen kids, some kids that have flourished in an online space. We see others that do very well in a hybrid space. We see others that very much uh, that picture perform I in a hybrid. You. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and and we see for some that it doesn't work so well. They they use the desk. <laughs> On day four of online learning. Yeah, day four of online learning. He's, he's, he's doing somersaults. Yeah. Kind of monkey bars off the desk. But uh, for some it works, for some it doesn't. But to that point, um, what what do those options look like in, in the name of personalized learning to meet the needs of students where they are? And you're right, it's changed. It's yeah. Changed. I think it changes uh, the way you look at facilities. It changes the way yep. you look at what is needed in those facilities. It changes... Uh, the way we look at staffing. And it also, I think, for our district, uh, one important thing that it makes is, gives us an opportunity to look at closer is um, not that traditional um, three month summer off. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe looking at that because that, uh, that uh, traditional uh, format of schooling doesn't benefit the vast majority of students we have in our district that we're trying to uh, help achieve. I'm so looking forward to this conversation, Jen, you just captured. <laughs> when are we going to have this? <laughs> Star Trek. Yeah, yeah, we're, yeah, we're, but that's the, those are the conversations we need to be having because we, we do want to be proactive. We want to forward think on this and, mm -hmm. and see, you know, what, what is, what is within the realm of possibility and how might that be realized for our kids? Okay, any other comments or questions? That's exciting. Okay, Superintendent, we'll stay with you for an update on the keeping uh, Ogden keeping healthy. Keeping healthy. Uh, you see, you're seeing across the state an increase. Um, fortunately, it's not at the same percentage uh, in our district as you're seeing in other districts. I'm just sharing with you here, this is... Uh, coronavirus.utah.gov. They're starting to build out some um, uh, some dashboards. We, as I mentioned uh, in our last board meeting a couple weeks ago, we're, we're working on some dashboards and some prototypes as well. But right now, what you'll see here, and this is the uh, uh, the state's main page on coronavirus and tracking that type of information. But if you go through here, you can take a look, and it's broken down according to uh, jurisdictions, uh, primarily counties and or uh, health districts. But anyway, if you take a look over here on this top line, you've got this schools. Let's see. Well, you have a schools tab right here. And if you click on that, it takes you to 
all the different school districts and a few charters as well. But this gives you uh, an idea as to what's going on across the state. Sorry, I'm trying to zoom it in. It's being somewhat responsive, somewhat not. But if you take a look there, uh, and, it, and you can sort them, uh, dis descending, ascending, but uh, total cases, so forth. If you take a look at that, you can just go down the, the row. It, it shows you which jurisdiction or which health department um, you're looking at. We are the Weaver Morgan Health Department, uh, uh, which takes in Weaver County and Morgan County. But if you come down here, it'll give you an idea. Ogden uh, City District, Weaver Morgan Health Department. We currently have eight active uh, COVID cases, according uh, to, this, to this report, this website. But what it doesn't do, it does show your total cases. That includes those that have, been, have recovered. But uh, if, you, if you take a look at that, it, it does identify what some of the needs are. And you can take a look at some of the trends. Um, as we engage our community, uh, too, we want to be able to work through some of the privacy issues. So this certainly is not violating any privacy or, or getting at any privacy issues. They're just saying there's eight active cases that have been involved in some way at our schools, whether... Um, a student or a staff member tested positive while on our campus. That's what that reflects, right? As the number of cases that have impacted in some way uh, the Ogden School District. As, as we take a look at that, uh, of course, that those eight positive cases as represented here had an impact in terms of who students or staff and or staff get quarantined. Meaning, let, let's say we have a, a student who comes to school. They go home from school that night. They start getting some symptoms. Uh, they go get tested. You know, two days later, it's, it's been identified they're positive. Uh, what ends up happening then is through the process of contact tracing, identify all the students and or staff who are around that student for within six feet. You know, we're all still wearing our masks. We're all doing hand sanitizer and sanitation. But as a, as a mitigation effort, identifying, okay, for all the students that were within six feet of that student for more than 15 minutes, you know, they go in quarantine as a safety protocol so we can prevent a school-wide outbreak, meaning there's a higher risk. I mean, we're all six-plus feet away, but if we weren't in that, in that space and, and one of us were to come down with it, then would the person sitting next to them um, also get it? And so that's why they, they go home for 14 days. They still receive their educational services. And uh, at, at this point, uh, as reported, we uh, have not seen an in-school transmission that we can determine uh, definitively, meaning a person is identified, the, everyone that's been identified to go into quarantine for having been associated with the individual. Uh, none of them have become symptomatic and or tested positive. Um, that can change any minute. Uh, you know, I'll just say that, right? Because it's a, an ever-changing uh, situation. Next steps for us in terms of circulating information with the community, we're working on our, our own dashboard. Uh, Mr. Bates and I have been brainstorming even um, earlier today as to, to what would that look like and what does the format look like, that one that maintains the privacy of students and staff who do test positive, uh, but also gives our, our community an understanding, even by school location, what the current situation is. Uh, to do that, there's a few different strategies that we're exploring. Is you would list a school's name, uh, active cases, instead of saying one, because that, that then becomes a little bit easier to identify perhaps who that one is. But if what would it look like to say, this school has zero to three cases or zero to five? And then we would publish that, right? And that's what it would say, name a school, zero to three cases, if we were to use zero to three, and we're still working on some of those details um, to identify that. Or would it say a school's name, four to eight cases, nine to 14, 15 plus, right? And so it's just very community facing and identifying the number of, of uh, students and staff that are actively quarantined. Fortunately, uh, we're still far less than 1% of all of our uh, students and staff um, who have tested positive. And the number of students in quarantine, you know, we're just above 1% of all students and staff. So for the most part, you're looking at 98, 99% of, of students and staff are, are still engaging on site, on campus, and those that aren't are doing so virtually. Uh, where their circumstances allow, that's where we provided devices and hotspots to make sure that they can still connect uh, with their educational process. But 
Um, to that end, we're we're not at a point where we're looking at you know any. We're, we're not we're not seeing the numbers that other schools are where they start to have to discuss closing the school down for two weeks or mm -hmm. moving to a hybrid schedule. In terms of process, um, when or if that time does come, we would come back. We'd probably call a special meeting of the board. Uh, to discuss the data, have health department representation here, and we would we would look at the data, the numbers, and and work to recommendation. What would that look like if one of our schools had to go into a two week quarantine? So we could sanitize, control the outbreak. We're just we're not there. We're not there right now, um, which is which is a, a nice place to be. But knowing that that can change, that can change. But we're prepared on either. On, on any on any and every account, we'll we'll be ready to make the adjustments that we need. But we do want to provide that uh, one internally, two externally, uh, to create that awareness because unfortunately, it's not it's playing out a little bit differently in other locations in our state. Uh, we just want to make sure that we don't that we're providing enough information that people aren't guessing at what's going on in the Ogden School District, but we're able to provide uh, some assurances as to what our current reality is. That, unless there's any other questions, that concludes my reports. Uh, yeah. Madam well, Vice have President. One sort of update, like from our own particular school, but probably has seen the same there too, is the report that the uh, two known that we've had in ours is because of siblings that are from the county coming back home. Oh. College. <laughs> yeah, the college. Oh. <laughs> the college down south is. Uh, allowing that to come back home, and then that's how we have to have to yeah. deal with some of that. But on campus, and I think same as Ogden, yeah, there's nothing that's starting, and that's the good thing. It it is a good thing, and and we will, and we got to be careful with that though. But uh, in terms of exact sure. numbers, but you're you're exactly right. And what we're seeing in terms of even those kids that are in quarantine. It's not because they were at school around someone. It's because maybe someone in their home has COVID. And under under the current Utah Department of Health guidelines, and if that's the case, and they, they need to quarantine at home and not come to school, even though they don't have it, someone in their home does. Correct. Right? So, But we still count that number as one of our students that's quarantined. Yeah. So, but, but you're right. I mean, it's, it's how do you separate saying how much of the quarantine or active cases are at the school can be attributed to the school versus... You know, by association, a household, a family member, a friend, uh, whatever that association looks like. I mean, think about a couple of friends hanging out on the weekend, one test positive for COVID, and you know, and then obviously they they need to go into quarantine, right, to that end. Right. But anyway, uh, very proud of um, uh, Karen Harrop. She's our director of special education, and our nurses have have done just a phenomenal job. Uh, keeping track of the number of cases, working with the health department, working with our schools as we work through contact tracing uh, to keep us safe and healthy, keeping Ogden healthy. So it's an ongoing process uh, that changes daily, uh, but we're, uh, we're, we're things are going pretty pretty good. Um, as and I say pretty good because I think any cases are too many cases, right? We wish it were otherwise, uh, but all things considered, we're we're, we're doing okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Board Vice President yes. Wilson, may, may I ask the superintendent a question, please? Absolutely. Okay. Um, so if a student is sent home because they're symptomatic, uh, but we can't force them to get tested, uh, what if they don't get tested? And so we can't verify that positive. Therefore, we can't, or, or do we still notify the people that were in close contact, even if the positive case wasn't verified, but they were symptomatic? No, under under the Department of Well, they can't come back to school until they're not symptomatic, and then like 24 hours after that, if they refuse to get tested um, under the current. Department of Health guidelines, uh, as you already mentioned, we, we can't we can't force them. But under those guidelines, we we don't inform of possible exposure unless there's a positive, a confirmed, a verified positive result. Right. Which which is why we stress so 
so much that if a child and and we're the messaging going out on multiple platforms, multiple ways from multiple sources. But if a child's sick, they really ought to stay home. Um, and you know, if they get sick at school, which happens, right? It gets happens. We put them in a quarantine room. Uh, a, you know, <laughs> kind of that sick room space until a parent can can come pick them up. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's just imperative uh, working together with our community, with our families. If a child is exhib exhibiting any symptoms, the please, please do not send them to school. Um, until such time as they they are not symptomatic. And are we providing families with resources like uh, names of places where they can go to get tested to make it as easy for them as possible? Yeah, so we we do circulate, and uh, um, Mr. Bates might be able to speak to some specific things that he's circulated. But we we do provide that resource in terms of there's free testing clinics. Uh, that have been set up or established uh, and um, we'll be circulating more information in the near future uh, per the Utah Department of Health's guidelines in terms of additional opportunities uh, for people to get tested at little to no cost uh, but that some of those details are still emerging um, so I don't have anything definitive to say there but we, we do encourage and, and provide a, a space that if if parents need a place to go or they ask that we're, we're at the ready to be able to provide that information. Again, stopping short of saying you need to go get your, you need, you, you, you need to go get so-and-so tested. Um, but they are exhibiting symptoms. Here's a list of places that you might consider. Thanks, Dr. Nye. Thank you. Any other comments, questions? I think that was it, wasn't it, for the our agenda? For the agenda, yeah. So thank you, everyone, for all of the questions and input, and look forward to our next meeting. <laughs>